We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And this is episode 118. And what we're going to be talking, I know, 118, Bob. We were just talking off air about where does the time go? I've no idea. (laughs) We've had over 35 and a half thousand downloads of our podcast so far. My God, that's fantastic. That's just on Spotify. That's not counting the YouTube channel. I've no idea how many there are on there, but Uh, we're doing really well. That's good, isn't it? It is. I'm, I'm very impressed. I think we're doing brilliant. Fantastic. Well done to you. And to you. Stop congratulating. I'm liking that. So maybe this is a good thing with the topic of today's podcast because we're going to be looking at codependency in the therapy process. Wow, what a subject area! And and you know, I didn't realise we got to that many uh, podcasts, and also I hadn't realised we'd done so many people listen to us. So thank you very much to the visitors who and the people who keep listening to us. Absolutely, very uh, moving. Okay, codependency, a really big subject area, this is. So I expect most of the listeners understand what codependency is. I'll talk a bit about what it is in a minute. It's also called um, another word in transaction analysis world, Eric Byrne and etc. And that's symbiosis. Yeah. A symbiosis is a biological term, you know, for when, for means really when two organisms act as one. Um, so symbiosis is the term really for co- co- you know what we just said codependency in in other words um, and codependency many people talk about being in codependent relationships or addicted to codependent relationships and and in essence they're unhealthy yes in essence yeah I mean some co- some codependent relationships if you like um, carry on uh in that sort of uh template um uh, because both people in the codependent relationship have codependent scripts and um they sort of rub along in those interlocking scripts but in essence it's unhealthy and it's unhealthy because if you're in a codependent relationship or a symbiotic relationship in ta terms the adult goes out of the window yeah would you say, would you sort of put it that way? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like the, the parent of one and the child of the other is interlinked and vice versa. It's kind of, yeah, it's the, it's not a, a healthy adult to adult. I'm okay. You're okay. Relationship. No, it's a, it's a, an unhealthy one in essence. Yeah. And do you see many people in your practice um, from a code, you know, who come with codependent issues? I think so. I think. To be fair, we all have codependent issues to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. I suppose I meant when they're entrenched. So, for example, when somebody uh, is coming from the child ego state, uh, a large degree of the time, so they pass ownership, if you ownership over to the person who is in the parent ego state. In yeah. terms of self definition, empowerment, action oriented processes, um, they pass they pass over, if you like, to the person in the parent position, um, their self agency or their ability of self agency uh, in an autonomous way to the parent, and so it's the parent that self who defines the identity of the other person. Yeah in an entrenched way. You are correct. I think there's traits of where we may um, interchange in, or even be in a, a, a codependency relationship. But I'm only talking about when they, the patterns are entrenched so that the adult goes missing. I'm not sure about entrenched. I'd have to think about that. But definitely, 
in the couples, one will play the parent role and one will play the child role. But I think it shifts. It's not entrenched in that one relationship, if that makes sense. Not fixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the more fixed the codependency template is, the more fixed the symbiosis is, the more I understand leads to an unhealthy position. Yeah. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. So when you're talking about codependency, are you talking about codependency between the therapist and the client or the client no. coming with codependency I'm outside talking, of the therapy room? I might want to make that clear. I'm talking about where the client comes to see the therapist and their contract may well be about moving away from a codependent position okay. with their partner or codependent, you know, that that's the frame I'm talking about. Okay. Now, we can get on in a minute. We can get in a minute in the podcast to how codependency with the therapist might happen. So we can move there in a minute. I'm talking about when the client comes into the room yeah. and says, um, I feel I'm in a codependent relationship and I'd like to move away from it. So I've got a more sense of agency or autonomy. Yeah. Now, that scenario in my professional career was quite common. Yes. Yeah. I'm with you now. Yeah. Yeah, with with maybe a, a, an overbearing parent or or something yeah. like that, or you know where a parent doesn't want the child to grow up and be independent and leave home and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And usually, usually, with that sort of personal profile you just talked about there, they usually come from that place in a script process. In other words, it's the position they've taken psychologically with their significant caretakers. And when they move from the relationship with their significant caretakers, they unconsciously, and actually perhaps a bit consciously, but we'll say unconsciously, out of awareness, if you, if you like that word, they seek the replication of that codependent process that was the hallmark of the script with the initial caretakers. Yeah. So the repeating patterns in relationships. Yeah. 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 And you, and we'll go. I know we're going to get onto the third bit in the moment, but usually they then seek to play the same process out. Yeah. But we'll get there in a minute. So yes, they're repeating patterns, as yeah. you've just said, and they come usually when those patterns, for whatever reason, are becoming uncomfortable or too intense. Or too, um, dis yeah, too unplayable in their lives, they come to therapy. Yeah. So the discomfort of the codependency has become so intense that they then come to therapy. Yeah, because if they're playing in a, a, a codependent relationship, and I'm, I'm presuming that the person in the codependent relationship that is getting all their needs met isn't going to be the one that comes to therapy it's going to be the other party to that that comes to therapy well interestingly that's a really interesting statement yeah that's a very interesting statement jackie i would say in my experience yes in the sense that it's often the person who feels defined who feels a one down position yeah who feels um undermined who feels that they're always in that child position in transaction analysis yes so i think you're correct however having said that i'm agreeing with you people often come often yeah i think it's true will come to therapy when they feel that they're in or may they're in a relationship where they feel their partner never takes agency of any responsibility. Yeah. They feel that they have to do all the work, they have to take all the responsibility, they have to do everything, and that the other person is passing that on to them. 
Yeah, yeah. So you've got two sides of it. Yes. I do think you're right, by the way, what you've just said, is that I think more people will tend to come when they're in the child position and feel defined, put down in a one. But then you do get people. Bob, just hang on. Just hang on to that thought a minute. Somebody's at my door. I think it's a parcel. A parcel? Oh, she's disappeared now. Do I go and parent adult and child here? Uh, I think I'll stay in my adult. But she has disappeared. I don't think I've got any abandonment um, fears yet. Okay, she's back. Oh, good, Mike. I'm back. Oh, it's oh, all right. I'll chop that bit out when we're, we're doing it. Don't worry. Oh, I was talking. They'll probably find it quite interesting. I was talking about my constant object is back. <laughs> right, we'll carry on then. Yeah, so, bad. yes, I, that's a very valid point that, yeah, we probably will see the other one as well if the other person is not taking ownership of certain things in the relationship and one person is having to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, I've come here because my partner is so infantile. I'm having to do everything in the relationship. You know, I have to do this, 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 this. And if I start to um, ask, ask her to take or him to pay, take responsibilities, uh, they, they aren't capable to do that. So I'm doing 90 percent of the work. and I need to change this and look at where these patterns come from. Yeah. Now, that's the other side. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, to be fair, I have probably seen both of those in the therapy room. I'd be astonished if you hadn't. Yeah. And in couples therapy particularly. Yes. Yeah. Now, as I've said, and I said a moment ago, that the person who moves into the child position in transaction analysis terms will be repeating their script and playing it out. And also the person that monopolises the parent position are usually, well, always 100%. I don't like 100%, but they're playing out their script, which they've uh, learnt in their childhood of origin. So they often might be people who've taken care of their parents. Yeah. But they, there's a term called parentification. It's an American term where the child has to grow up fast because they end up parenting an inadequate, significant caretaker yeah so they end up um taking this parent position and the cost of that of course is that their child needs their normal child needs don't get met because they've had to take care of the parent yeah and unfortunately they often carry that process into relationships they seek later and the, the person who i've just described on the other side will look out, this is unconsciously, look out for that type of person to fill the, to fulfil their own script. So you've got a symbiotic bond. Yes. Yeah. Because it's familiar to them. They, they know how it works. It's not, it, it's kind of like ends negatively. It's, it's never ends well, but it's familiar. So they know the process. They know how it feels and they know how to be in that symbiotic relationship. Yes. That's absolutely. It provides them a sense of identity. Yeah. Sense of who they are, a sense of predictability, a sense of continuity. Yeah. But the problem comes is as they go on in life, their discomfort to the discomfort of not being able to be an adult, if you like, not being able to, from the child's side, take a sense of ownership about agency, spon and responsibility if you want to put it that way or a sense of um you know, fulfilling their self-definition needs get acute they want to move from that place and from the parent position um all the things i've just said it becomes more acute and they realize um, perhaps these patterns we're talking about here and they want to get an adult to adult relationship which is far more healthy yeah. So in the therapy room, what sort of things can we do? One of the things I'm thinking is boundary setting. <laughs> a bit more. Just, you know, for, for us as therapists, if, you know, the person that comes in is trying to repeat that pattern of behaviour with us and, and set us up 
to play the game, so to speak, that we need to be quite firm in our boundaries of I'm okay, you're okay, and not taking responsibility for the client or, you know, disempowering them or that sort of stuff. Absolutely. When they start to play that out with you, I 100% agree with that. One of the things, how can I explain this? One of the things I always used to do when people came from either either side of the symbiosis would probably, after I've got the contract and as I've got the relationship quite strong, is do some educative therapy yeah. and teach them about codependency or symbiosis, like I'm doing here. Yeah. So that both sides, if it's couples therapy, I would always do this. But in individual therapy, I would teach them some transaction analysis because I think it's a really good model to explain how the child and parent ego states are interlocked together. Absolutely. And I would then help on either side of the symbiosis, then help them be aware of the origins of the early symbiosis. Yeah. To help them understand how they've got to where they are today and what needs to happen for a different outcome. Yeah. That's with them. We'll get on to me in a minute. I mean, get on to the therapist bits in a minute. Yeah. With people, that's usually the path I pay, that I take. Yeah. Yeah, because ultimately, for either side, really, it's about strengthening the adult ego state and getting us in that more than the parent and the child ego state. Yeah, and the trick is, how do you get there? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Slow and yeah. steady wins the race. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a developmental therapist. I always have been. That means working aggressively in the past. That means working with the developmental unmet needs. That means going back to the etiology of the symbiosis. Yeah. And that means looking at the symbiosis, which has been played out between the original parent or caretaker figure with the younger self yeah so when we go back there if we look at the child part of the symbiosis then we will start to see that usually they have a parent ego state a significant caretaker mother or father which plays the role of defining them not allowing them maybe to grow up yeah um a sense of a parent that it may be overwhelming or overbearing or any of those processes we've talked many about many times in podcasts. So we've got the defining, overbearing, overwhelming parent and the the child or the you know the younger self, I will say child in this case, could be teenager or whatever, um, isn't able to not only have their unmet relational needs met, but they often get stuck at a particular develop developmental time in history. And they have gone through the necessary processes because the permissions haven't been given from the parent to actually grow up, if you like. Yeah. So they, they seek out same type of relationship. And in a way they get frozen in time. Yeah. So you need to go back to that time to help them empower themselves, help them understand the process, and often usually redecide to take back the power from the defining, overwhelming parent. Yeah. Which there's so many different parts to that it sounds quite simple when you're you saying it like that you know to be this yeah, is yeah, what we do yeah. but it's that good. that's yeah. there's a lot of things involved in that there's lots of layers of stuff there's loads of layers and stuff yeah one of them and probably the most important i think is that the therapist is thinking developmentally because if they're not thinking developmentally they won't even go back in time to the younger self 
they will be thinking about behavioral or cognitive resolution in the present. Yeah. Which is a completely different type of therapy. Yeah. I'm talking about the therapist that thinks developmentally to so looks back at the original relationship and sees how it's enacted out in their present life. So first step is for the therapist to think developmentally. The second bit I think is to help the clients actually, and you often do this by two chair technique, by the way, um, or role play for the listeners to make a new decision in the role play with the fantasy parent. Yeah. Does that's that make something that yeah, absolutely. That's something that I I don't do in therapy is two chair work. I've I've not I've not gone down that road. Mm. So it's a very good technique and we've done a podcast on that, I think. We have, yeah, a long, long time ago. Yeah. So it's a very good technique for several reasons. One that the therapist can see the relation early relational dialogue between the parent and the child. But it's also a good technique for the client to start to, to practice uh, through role play, if you like, empowering themselves in relation to their early parent. Yeah. So I think it's a very useful technique because from that position, with the protection of the therapist, they can actually start role-playing new decisions which hopefully down the line through the therapist's protection can help them integrate those new decisions and choose different relationships in the present. Or at least make a new decision to be different in the relationships they choose or are in in the present. Yeah. Yeah, because the first thing is being aware of the relationship patterns that we've got and then choosing yeah. whether we want to do something about it. And that's where the stickiness is, is, okay, what do I do about it now? How can I change now that I'm aware that this is what I do? So here's Jackie, here's, you might find this a challenging inquiry and it's not meant to be. Okay. But I will be interested in your answer. If you don't go back developmentally and you don't get them dialoguing dialoguing with the parent so they can empower themselves and be different you said you don't do this what would you do instead a, a, a lot of educational stuff okay definitely. Me, i'm interested tell me a little bit more for the podcasters who are listening because i'm a developmental therapist and that's the way i do things and i know there's another world of people who do in different ways. And I'm sure the podcast people listening to this might be interested in other ways of doing this. So as I am, by the way, so I'd be interested. I would look at, you know, talking about and doing work around what a healthy relationship is. Mm. I would do work around the kind of... Um, ages and stages and when we start what ages we start to individuate and separate out and I would also look at you know attachment the way that we attach to people maybe some stuff around fear of abandonment what happens if you change is there a fear that you're going to be on your own I think there's lots of that sort of stuff that I would work with how interesting so would you say and you might say no that's not the case Bob that's fine by the way would you say that the work is fairly cognitive from the position you're talking? Yeah, I would. Yeah, so, you know, more cognitive. Uh, uh, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Um, I think for people listening, and uh, maybe even a health warning, <laughs> if you go developmentally, there's much more, I think, of an emotional content in the work. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's probably why I go right down the cognitive route. 
Yeah, maybe. It, yeah. It's it's something I'm I am aware of as a psychotherapist. That do you know what I mean? I'm definitely a thinker and a doer as opposed to being in touch with my own feelings and emotions and stuff. It's an ongoing thing with me. Right. So, it's so it's <laughs> important because I'm suggesting a way of working which is developmental and getting in touch with the unmet needs that the child had to give up. Yeah in the symbiotic process. So it's often a lot of emotionality in the work. And also from the other position, from the the person who had to take the parent position uh, and say parentification was the model I used early on. In other words, had to take care of the parent early on for lots of reasons. Maybe the parent was child work maybe they were inadequate maybe there was a lot of neglect or whatever way we're talking about it maybe they were in a very big family where they had to you know take the parent role very early in life but the cost in all those scenarios is quite often they grow up person grows up very fast and their early childhood needs are missed yeah absolutely 100 percent agree yeah yeah so if we're going to revisit all that, then we're talking about the emotional world of loss. Yeah. Emotional world of, you know, uh, fear of uh, perhaps more abandonment or whatever we're talking about. But we are talking about an emotional world. And from that place, it's about making new decisions again. Yeah. Basically get integrated down the line. Yeah, absolutely. And as you're talking about that, I'm thinking that one of the things that has definitely played out with some clients and the relationship is that when they are open and honest and emotionally attached to people, mm. the fear then that they will be left. Yes, that's it. Do you know what I mean? Like if I go in emotionally into this next relationship, and it doesn't work out, then what happens? Yeah. It's like a protective mechanism sort of thing, yeah. Now, I know we only have time, but I'd like to go to your second place you were talking about earlier on, about a symbiosis with the therapist. Yeah. Now, that's really important, because from either position, the parent role or the child role, they will attempt to enact out the same symbiosis with you yeah and what your first response i really thought was so important around boundary setting yeah so you don't fall into that trap which they will unconsciously set for you yeah yes yeah which i suppose to a certain extent most if not all clients do anyway <laughs> they're not aware of the traps that they're setting Oh yeah, I've I've become so much more aware of of that sometimes. You see, they'll have to do it. Yeah, and I'll tell you what I mean by have to do it. I don't mean from conscious choice. I mean from unconscious relational patterns, which start way back in the past. In relation to their unmet needs, and also, again unconsciously. So they can make you predictable, sense of continuity, and fits into their symbiotic relational framework. Yeah. Now, if they don't succeed with that, then they will try again, try again. And if they still don't succeed in that, then therapy might begin. Yeah. You know, yeah. a different phase of therapy will begin. Yeah, yeah, a deeper level. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I think that there's something as well about, again, you know, building that adult ego state, but helping or supporting the client to start to trust themselves mm. in relationships, that they mm. are enough, do you know what I mean? And, and that sort of thing, making them more resilient to things. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm, mm. so you only see people through your door who want to change from either position yes 
So if they feel that they can continue in a way or, uh, or enact out the same script position which they had from their history and that's enough for them, you don't see them. Yeah. That's okay in my book. They don't have to get to a place of high discomfort uh, from either side, but the people you do see will be when the intense codependency or symbiosis is too high, if you like, that they come through your door. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's not, when you know, when you're getting into that relationship, you might think this is really good, do you know what yeah. I mean? But yeah. the longer term prospect of that is it's not a healthy relationship. It's not, an, you know, it's not an I'm okay, you're okay. It's not equal. It's very unbiased, a, a very biased, whatever right. the word is. That's the way I see it. And as I say, it gets to that discomfort level, which is too intense. They'll come through your door. Yeah. And um, whether it's about the way you were talking, the way the direction will go, or whether it's more developmental, which I was talking earlier on, either way, at the end of the day, um, I think there needs to be some shift in awareness. Yeah. So that then can lead, hopefully, to a different type of decision making or stroke and different coping mechanisms. Yeah. See, when you're talking, I, I definitely need to come and do some more training around two chair work because I can see how it works. But when when you were talking about the two chair work, I was also thinking it's an opportunity for each person, wherever they are, to see things from the other person's point of view as well, which I think that's the learning bit to it a lot of the time, is to see it from a different perspective. Or, stroke and, to see the fixed relationship. Yeah. In other words, to see how it really is and that actually... This type of relationship is going to go for on forever. Yes. No yeah. change. Yeah. So both. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting, Bob. I think it's a fascinating subject, and I think that um, it's something I've dealt with a lot when I was a therapist, and well, still when when therapy intensives, and I'm sure you do uh, in in this whole continuum uh, a lot. Mm. Yeah. And so, as always, uh, you know, I love transactional analysis for this because there's a yeah. diagram and a model for everything. Oh, if you talk about diagrams, and I haven't gone into diagrams, you've got, if you want to go from the TA world, you've got things which are called first order symbiosis and second order symbiosis. I have purposefully not particularly done it on this podcast because it gets a bit more complex to explain. Yeah. If you want to buy a book, there's many books on codependency, if you want to look at it further in the transaction analysis world, you could buy TA Today by Ian Stewart. And that goes into first order symbiosis, second order symbiosis. And there's lovely diagrams and like you talked about and structures and things like that. Um, but it's a very, there's a lot written on codependency and symbiosis. Yeah. yeah. It's, to be fair, it must have been around for as long as relationships have. <laughs> Well, oh, yeah, how could it not be? Because yeah. really you're talking about a relational pattern which was developed in relation to your caretakers that is enacted out in your relationships today. Yeah. So might be different words over the decades, years or centuries, but that relational pattern from past to present, I believe, is always evident. Yeah. So, Bob, until next time, where we will be talking about something completely different. What's that? <laughs> We're going to be talking about building your own therapy website. Oh, now, I the think... do's and don'ts, maybe. I think we did one on social media. But if we're particularly talking about websites, well, I've certainly got a lot to say about that. Okie doke, until next time, Bob. Thank you. Oh, I look forward to it. See you. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.